see all of you here this morning. Great to see you here today. Merry Christmas, of course, uh, to all of you. Uh, I'm so happy that we uh, have this moment here as, as friends and family and united in Christ to share in the joy of worship, to share in this time of fellowship with one another. So thank you for sharing in this gift this morning. Let's get right to it this morning. Uh, that's my present to all of you. I'm going to get right to my point. <laughs> Our story this morning is a story with a great promise, and I think that it's the kind of promise that can make all the difference for you and me. When we last left off, we were in the Gospel of Matthew, and you may remember, Jesus has just risen from the grave, but not everybody knows it yet. In fact, many people have not yet heard the news. Right now, the the women who were at the tomb that is now empty have just realized that Jesus is risen, and they're stumbling away from the tomb, their hearts ablaze with joy. They're running to go find the other disciples and tell them when suddenly, if you're following along in your Bible, it's chapter 28 and verse 9, suddenly Jesus appears before them and he greets them. And we read in verse 10 that they came to him, they took hold of his feet, and they worshipped him right there on the road. That's one way. People respond to the risen Jesus. But there are others. Around that same time, there were others who had seen the empty tomb as well. The guards who had been assigned to guard this tomb, they've seen it as well. And they're stumbling away from the tomb as well. White as a sheet. They can't believe what they have just seen. And if we continue to read in the chapter, we read verse 11 that they are ushered into a quiet back room, and the priests are there, and the elders of the people are there, and they're told to get their story straight. And they're given a story to get straight. Verse 13, you are to say, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And then a handful of money is stuffed into their pockets, given a slap on the back and said, do as you're told. And so they do. That's how we get to this last part, the end of the gospel. And that's where we're going to be spending some time this morning. Jesus reunites with his closest disciples on a hill outside of Galilee. And I think what we're going to see this morning, as I've mentioned already, is that the gospel of Matthew ends with a plan and with a great promise. And it ends in the same way that it began. If you'd like to turn there, we'll also have it on the screens as well. Matthew chapter 28, beginning in verse 16. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him there, they worshipped him. But some doubted. And Jesus came and he said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Now, for a long, long time, Christians have called this passage right here that we just read the Great Commission, and rightly so. Because in these words that we've just read here together, the last of Jesus in this gospel, we find God's plan to reach the world. We find here God's desire in his heart of heart to go to every corner and pocket of the earth, every sphere of influence that you can find, every white picket-fenced house or hut or palace or slum, go to the people there. And for His grace to reach those people who are right there in those places. It's a remarkable plan. But you know what else? This plan is remarkable also. For another reason, it's because God desires to accomplish this plan 
through you and people like you, including but not limited to you. God wants to reach every corner and pocket and sphere of influence in the world through people like us. Christians have long called this passage the Great Commission, and rightly so. But let's not forget also that in this passage, I think we find an even greater promise. And we read it right here. Jesus says, I am with you always. The promise is that as we go into all the world, or wherever we may go in this world, God is saying to us here, you are never going alone. Now, as you know, if you've been here with us this year, we began this year with a, a theme and a question that we were asking this year. Our, our theme for this year centered around that word faithful. When we were talking this year, starting in January, we've been searching for what it means to be faithful to God. And not just that, for what it means for God to be faithful to us. And I think that it's only fitting that after all of our searching this year that we should end right here in this place with this promise. Because to me, there's no better way to know and see what God's faithfulness is like than to hear him say, I am with you always. Just think of the places that we've gone this year together as we've been looking for what faithfulness is. We began this year, we started on a journey through the, the books of Genesis and the books of the book of Genesis and the book of Exodus. We followed in the footsteps of Abraham. Remember Abraham? So many missteps, so many mistakes along the way. So many times you want to say, I can't believe what you're doing, Abraham. And yet, at every point in that story, what do we find? God sticks with Abraham, doesn't he? right up until the moment that the promise is made real for him. And he has the son, and it brings laughter to his life, his son Isaac. It's as if God is saying, I am with you always. And we talked about Isaac. And we talked about Jacob after him. And we talked about Joseph after him. We saw Joseph thrown into the pit thrown into slavery in Egypt. Things could not have been worse. He was disowned by his own brothers. Yet what do we find in that story at every turn? I am with you always. So much so that at the end of it all, Joseph is able to say to the very brothers who disowned him, what you intended for evil, God has meant for good. You see, Joseph really believed that God had been with him every step of the way and that he had made things right. I'm with you always. From there, we went to Moses. We found Moses in a dark place. Moses was called to do a great thing for God. But he needed some convincing in his life. In fact, he comes up to God at the burning bush and he says, how can I do this? How can I do this thing that you called me to do? Lead the people of Israel out of Egypt. I don't even know your name. What should I tell them if they ask for your name? And you remember what God said. I am. A name that stands for eternity. Mystery. Presence. I am with you always. And with those words as his assurance, Moses turns his face toward Egypt. In the summer, we spent some time in the, the Ten Commandments. We were talking then about what it means for a people who love God to be faithful to God's word. I think that what we find when we look back is that that promise is ringing loud and clear in the Ten Commandments as well. The whole point of God's law, right, is so that God's people can live in the presence of a holy God. 
God wanted His people with Him so much that He gave them away. To be holy as your heavenly Father is holy, as Leviticus says. And so He gave them these words to follow. The law was meant to teach Israel how to be with God. Because God wanted that so much. In September, we turned to the story of Ruth. You may remember that. We saw the struggles that Ruth and her mother-in-law Naomi faced along the way, their grief, their poverty, struggles with racism, struggles with doubt, struggles with pain. It got so bad for Naomi at one point that she said, don't even call me Naomi anymore. That word means pleasant. Said, call me Mara meaning bitter. She felt so alone. She thought that she had been forgotten. Yet what does that story teach us most of all? That even in those moments when we feel like we've been forgotten, God is still there saying to us, I am with you always. And then this fall we came here to the Gospel of Matthew. We've been following in the footsteps of Jesus from His first breath until now. The grand reveal, Christ is risen. And when Christ utters His last words in this Gospel, they bring us back to what we've been seeing all along. What we've been seeing from the beginning of the story. From Abraham and earlier still, and what we've been seeing from the beginning of Matthew's Gospel. For when his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit, and her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. You remember, we studied this story together. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Listen to this. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. From the first breath of this story to the last, this is a story that says to us, God is with us. We know what faithfulness is because God has shown it to us. Time and time again, He renews that promise again when we need it most. And if you hear nothing else this morning or remember nothing else from this series we've had together, I hope that you remember this. That we know God's faithfulness because He has had steadfast presence in our lives. And He promises to be near us. Near us when we need Him. Nearest when we need Him most. The promise and plan of God have always been to be closer. To draw near. To bridge the gap. To walk alongside the people that He had created in love. And we know that God cared for us because He came close enough to touch And he carried a cross saying, I'm with you so that we might say in return, yes, Lord, I'm with you too. And live in his holy presence, unstained by sin, unstoppable, even in the face of death. I wonder if this is a message you need to hear this morning. It's our last Sunday of 2016, think back to the past year for you. Throughout this year, have you been listening to the promise of God renewed again and again? 
Have you heard him say, I am with you always? Or maybe this has been a year that it's hard to feel like that. Maybe this has been a time for you where you've begun to feel distant, jaded or separated. It's easy, I I will admit, to get to those points in our lives when we feel like God is absent, or, or worse even, that he's unmoved, unaffected by our struggles or about the way that the, the world can be. But what I want to gently remind us this morning to carry with us from this place is that God is nearer than ever before. For when Christ ascended from that hill, God has given his spirit to those who believe in him. As we read in Acts chapter 2, those who believed in him, who repented and, and were baptized in his name, were given the gift of God's spirit dwelling within them. God's so near that he is in our hearts to be with us always. He is with us always. I want to close with one last thing this morning. Remember the way that this passage began. We'll finish with this. Something curious about this first verse of the the passage we read, the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain, And when they saw Jesus there, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Makes me wonder, doubted what exactly? Did they doubt that Jesus had risen from the grave? Well, he's standing right there, so close you could touch him, pinch him, hear his voice, feel that he's real. Did they doubt that the things he claimed were true about him were actually true? Well, he's standing right there, close enough that you could touch him, pinch him, hear his voice. Even after they had just seen him die on a cross, still he's here. That seems to validate his claims, doesn't it? I don't know what they were doubting. It could have been those things. It could have been other things. We don't really know. Part of me wonders, though, If what they're doubting in this story is not that Jesus is risen, and is not that Jesus is who he claimed to be, part of me wonders if what they're doubting is that Jesus is going to actually accomplish what he set out to accomplish. You remember they were thinking of Israel becoming that kingdom on earth that ruled the world. Pretty soon they're going to find that that's not actually what God had in mind for his Messiah. I don't know if this is what they're doubting here. But I think for us, maybe this is the thing that we find ourselves doubting. Not that Jesus rose from the grave. Not that Jesus is who he claimed to be. But we find ourselves doubting the mission that we just read, that it's going to get done, so to speak, that it's going to be accomplished. And we look at our own hands and we say, you've given this to us, Lord? You've given this great mission to us? And this is where that promise becomes so supremely important to us. Because the last words that Jesus had to say in this gospel and the way this gospel ends is with a reminder. It addresses the very doubt that we are prone to carry. Jesus says, I'm with you always. This burden is not yours to carry alone. I am faithful. God is faithful. I'm with you. We give thanks this morning, now and always, because God is faithful now and always. We share in the joy of that this morning. As we sing our last song this morning, Let it be for us a pledge to be faithful because we know that God has been 
faithful long before we ever were, long before the worlds were formed, long before we uttered our first breath. And today we bask in the warmth of his presence around and in our lives. And maybe also today we respond to that. If we need to, maybe we respond by repenting of the ways that we've been running away from God rather than drawing near to him. He longs to be near us. Or maybe today you respond by committing your life in baptism to his name so that that spirit may dwell in you, that he may be with you like never before. Whatever the case may be today, we know that God has been faithful to us because he saved us and he's with us. Let's be faithful to him in return. And let's express our joy and our commitment now as we stand together and we sing this last song.